All right, it's been a while since I've uh, covered this topic. Everybody loves a good sequel, don't you? Of course you do. And uh, I was hanging out on my Mumble server last night talking with the usual uh, gang and uh, figured it would be fun to revisit uh, this topic again. It's Linux Does What Win Don't Part 3, right now, on Spatry's Cup of Linux. All right, uh, I don't know what prompted me to put this video up, but uh, uh, I don't know. I guess it's just some events in the news and that sort of thing. And then just going over all of my notes and stuff that I've collected over time uh, from even the previous uh, Linux Does What Win Don't videos and, uh, you know, new things that are out there. And uh, so I figured I'd put together another uh, ten things, and, uh, we'll start with number one, of course. No mandatory updates. You update your computer when you want to, and your computer will not send updates to other computers through a peer-to-peer -peer network. Does that sound familiar to you? We know that, uh, uh, I know I was reading about the other OS, and uh, they're actually doing stuff like that now, and people aren't aware that their computers are doing that right now. That sounds too much like malware to me. But, yeah, uh, don't really care for that one, really. All right, let's move on to number two. No spyware, no dialing home. That's right. Uh, does not dial home to report your activity, what software that's on your hard drive, and that sort of thing, so that somebody can remotely peruse your data on your hard drive and delete anything that's inappropriate. So if you're running Debian, Debian isn't going to dial home, and some penguin at the other end isn't going to uh, delete your family photo album, and that sort of thing. Whereas uh, if you agreed to the MS EULA, you have given them permission to go in and peruse your stuff. Of course, they're doing it all in the name of, you know, uh, piracy and that sort of thing. If they think you've got a pirated piece of software on your computer. But what's to say that this something like this can't be abused? What if they were to detect that I have a Linux partition and uh, some disgruntled employee over there just decides to delete my EXT4 partition just for laughs and giggles or something, huh? All right, well, there's too much abu potential for abuse there, but I'm sorry. Um, you know, uh, I want my computer to obey me not be restricted to the amount of freedom that a software company is going to give me. I need to have more freedom than that. And let's face it, proprietary operating systems just don't give you that level of freedom. Let's move on to number three. It supports more processor types. That's right, Linux runs on just about any architecture you can think of out there. Run to Best Buy and pick up a copy of Windows 10 and try and run that on your ARM processor. Good luck with that, huh? <laughs> Yet you can go to the Debian website and you can download Debian and run that on your ARM processor, your Raspberry Pi, your Spark Machine. Uh, there are so many different processor types. I mean, I could sit here and make a special show just on that alone and uh, you know talk about all the different processors and stuff like that, you know. Just face it, Linux just powers everything, you know, um, and you may even be surprised to note your smart refrigerator has a Linux operating system on it. All of your smart appliances with computer screens all run Linux now. It's really, really, truly amazing what Linux can do these days. Number four, Linux runs until the hardware fails. Unlike when I was using uh, Windows, I used to have to reboot my computer 
a minimum of once a day, but usually more than once a day. And my Linux machine, I can keep that running for days on end, on end, on end, on end. I actually update my system once a week, so I always reboot. Uh, whether or not it needs it, I just go ahead and do it. Um, because, well, my computer boots fast anyway. This old little laptop that I'm doing. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's quick by comparison to what it would be if I were running Windows. And believe me, I did, because I did have a Windows 7 partition on this not long ago. Uh, because there was a certain program I wanted to try out. And then eventually I got that program working in, in Linux and, well, didn't need the Windows 7 partition again. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good one there. Number five, know your machine inside and out. That's right. Because in Linux, you have access to the source code for all the software that you're running on your machine. However, when you're using a proprietary operating system, it's kind of like operating your computer with a black box that you just can't open, you know? Uh, now you can try and hack and try and reverse engineer to see how a piece of software is working, possibly by using a debugger and that sort of thing, but that's really no way to get your work done, you know? Um, being able to look at the code and make changes to it so that you can make the software better is the better option because then you make the changes to the software, you can share that with your friends, a friend may see the improvements that you made and say, hey, ding, like bulbs goes off, and they can make even more improvements to the improvements you made and send it back to you. How cool is that? I was talking about this one yesterday uh, on my show where I did an example of, you know, uh, being able to kill all wine processes uh, on my system. And this is something that is really cool about Linux in that you can make anything executable. Sometimes you can even get packages for Linux which will ship with binaries that are not executable for security reasons. So after you have checked the MD5 or SHA sum of that package, then you can extract it and then run change mod on it and then that bin becomes executable again. So it's just another great security feature that you have available to you, but also it gives you a great sense of satisfaction in knowing that you can just write one or two simple little lines of code that you can make executable and then be able to launch it on your system uh, and be able to use that anytime, anywhere. It's your machine, your choice, your power. I gotta thank my buddy Edge for this one. Number seven, fix your computer from a live CD. And why I haven't talked about this in in these uh, episodes before is beyond me. But hey, better late than never. Because this is something I have done even myself. Uh, being able to fix your computer using a live CD. Just boot your computer from a live CD and then and it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the exact same operating system. For instance, I'm running Manjaro, and I took a Gen 2 CD and uh, booted my computer with a Gen 2 CD, and then I was able to chirrut into my Manjaro installation and fix it. I was able to mount my, you know, I was able to mount my uh, operating system into the live CD, run updates on it, that fixed the problem, and zip, bada, boom. You just can't do that on any other OS with a live disk. And here's another one of my favorites. We're at number eight. Linux allows you to run legacy software that will not run on modern computer systems. If you look at the graphics on my TV screen here, you're going to see that... Uh, this is, this is proof of that. Uh, I'm using Macromedia Studio 8, which I purchased almost a decade ago, and it will not run on modern versions of Windows. Yet, yeah, I can run this on my modern Linux OS uh, using the Wine compatibility layer. I mean, really, just because I upgraded my OS, why should I have to go out and spend more money on new software that isn't necessarily going to give me improvements, but maybe give me more restrictions? Hello, subscription services they have out now? Uh, yeah. No, this, this 
decade-old software, you know, does everything that I need. I'm completely happy with it, and I really don't feel the need to have to fill the coffers of greedy software makers. Can anybody say planned obsolescence here? Well, Linux helps you fight planned obsolescence. And now on to number nine, and I have to laugh at this one. I've never covered this on my show before, but this one is true. You can delete any file in Linux, even it's, if it's in use. How many times when I was running Windows, I'm cleaning out the hard drive, looking at images, maybe looking at different things and determining what I want to get rid of, and I go to delete something and the computer goes, ah, 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 you can't delete the file because it is in use on the system. And that used to just annoy me to no end. Well, not in Linux, my friends. You can delete a video while you are watching it. I know that sounds crazy, but why would you want to do something like that? Well, for one thing, when you open a file in Linux, it gets moved into memory, and it's not reading it from the hard drive anymore. So, in the instance of a movie, uh, if you were to delete that from the hard drive, sure, the Linux operating system isn't going to complain, but as soon as that media player closes, <laughs> that file is lost. <laughs> But this is a really cool feature, and uh, yeah, gotta love it. All right, and now we're up to number 10. And uh, some of you are going to think this is ridiculous, but in truth, it isn't. Um, you can share your home directory with multiple distributions that you may have installed on your machine. Why would you want to do this? Well, let me set up a scenario for you and uh, explain where I'm coming from here. So let's say you have uh, Manjaro. Fedora and Ubuntu installed on your hard drive. You've got three OS's triple booting and each one of them is connected to a single home directory on your on your hard drive. Let's say you make a make it a separate partition. Okay, well there are advantages to doing this. Alright, so you've got your Firefox preferences set. Uh, in the home directory. You have your photo viewer preferences set. All of the individual software components, your, um, your music player, everything. And just imagine being able to boot into these different operating systems and have your settings remain cons consistent across all of them. Try sharing all of your settings with a triple boot of Windows XP, Windows 7, and Windows 10. Good luck with that. So at the end of the day, a computer is a tool. Nothing more, nothing less. And that tool should function in a way that you would come to expect. Your tools should not subjugate you and tell you, no, you are going to function the way I want you to function. No, 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 no. I want my computer to obey me. That is why I have it set up the way that it is. I don't want my computer to tell me, ah, 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 you can't run that three-hour rendering video job right now because I need to reboot. No, that's wrong. You shouldn't force updates on your end users. And if you are forcing updates on your end user, you are subjugating them. If your software is dialing home, to some authority who is going to decide what you can and can't have on your computer, that is not freedom. That is subjugation. Okay? You're being tyrannized by using such software. And in good conscience, I can't recommend to anybody any software that does something like that. And actually, that isn't software. It is malware. And it's it's shocking to see that software giants are now resorting to the tactics that malware and spyware manufacturers have been employing for many, many, many years. Well, that's all I have on this. There is a link in the description below where you can discuss this at cupoflinux.com. You can also hop in on our uh, Mumble server, usually uh, in the uh, evenings. Uh, I am on there, so pop in and say hi. 
Uh, you must be a member of the Cup of Linux community in good standing to be able to use the Mumble server. Uh, so I hope to hear from you guys there, and uh, Lord knows what I'm going to be doing next uh, in my videos, but um, I know I'll see you fairly soon. Peace out. Mm -hmm.